Hello and welcome back to Confessions of a Virtual Boss, your host and virtual boss Michael Brody, and it's a great pleasure to have you back again today. In this episode, I'm going to talk about something that's real special and, and close to me, very close to my heart. It's for all my young listeners out there. This episode is about, it's unique in a lot of respects, it's about how to become successful in your 20s. In fact, it's about how to be successful as a teenager. Screw 20s, let's start building businesses younger. I'm going to show you how I did it, and I'm going to show you how you can do it as well. I'm going to explain everything that went through my mind and my, um, you know, my thoughts back when I was 17, when I started the, the, the retail company before I became the virtual boss. So why am I qualified to give this show today? Okay, so let me just briefly touch down on my life story in less than two, three minutes. Because this show's not about me, it's about you. So back when I was 16 years old, I hustled... By the way, I hustled since the age of like 9 or 10. I sold things on eBay, I went to auctions, I sold things in the school. You know, I hustled, I hustled, hustled, wheeled and dealed as we say in the UK. When I was 17 years old, I opened a retail store, toy shop shopping center called the Metro Center, Gate said, which at the time, by the way, was, was Europe's largest shopping center. I signed the lease, despite being 17 years old, which in Britain is actually under the legal age to sign a contract, but, you know, screw it. It made it even more sweet, actually. The sweet part of that deal was the fact that I wasn't even the legal age to do the deal. I mean, come on. It shows you what the government knows. <laughs> so the shop actually got coverage in the newspaper. You can tweet me on Twitter, at the virtual boss. I'll send you a link of the article. Or you can Google Michael Brody Toys. That's M-I-C-H-A-E-L space B-R-O-D-I-E space T-O-Y-S toys. And you'll see the newspaper article. You see how fresh looking I am? How young? This is like seven, eight, eight years ago. If you want to make sure I'm not creating a fantasy story, check the article. Because there's a lot of people out there who are going to try to impress you. They're going to have the flashy videos, you know, showing the Ferrari, the big house. Don't fall for it. It's a marketing technique. It's called baiting. And they actually make their money. Some of these guys actually have the Ferraris, but guess how they get the Ferrari? For gullible people who fall for it, and they, they fork out thousands for worthless get-rich things. Which, oh, they, they, by the way, they just ep, off, often extract from books. They read books like Think and Grow Rich and um, you know How to Win Friends and Influence People, and they just repackage it and put it together and charge you 3000 for it. Which all, you know, fair play to them, but don't fall for it. You don't, you know, you don't need it. Richard Branson never bought a course. Sam Walton never bought a course. I think Bill Gates did. Mark Zuckerberg. Larry Allison. Mark Cuban. The Donald. None of these people bought the these three, four grand courses, so don't, don't think you need to either. Okay, so age 17, after the toy shop launched... And I, I was buying goods in the UK from middlemen and wholesalers. I decided I want to cut them out and I wanted to go direct. So me and my partner, who, who was the same age, we, we jumped on an aeroplane. This is we were 17 years old. This is 2010. And we ended up in a place called Guangzhou, China, at the world-famous Canton Import-Export Trade Show. China was... It was an experience. China was super. Like China was, it was totally different in the U.S. and the U.K. But it was, it was really, yeah, it was a real good experience. And we saw, we visited factories, we met suppliers, and we really saw how things worked. It opened our eyes to how the world worked in terms of leverage, in terms of, you know, cutting people out and making sure that we're getting the best price and maximizing margins. It was a buzz, and I loved doing deals. So I was in my element. So we got back from China, we, we, we expanded the business over the next two years, we began an import distribution business as well, you know, using our contacts in China, and we expanded the shops, we had multiple locations, I'm 19 years old at this point, back in, when is it, like 2012, and we self-financed this, by the way, we used leverage, there was no handouts, there was no family with, you know, here's a couple hundred thousand guys, we self-financed this over like a couple of year period as teenagers working crazy hours to get it up to a seven-figure business. We employed 40-plus staff, I think it was 42, it was 42 or 43, I think, you know, at our peak. 
So age 20, we decided we wanted to diversify. We wanted to make more money. We wanted to, to get involved in more business. So we bought a nightclub, a cabaret nightclub. Imagine this, a cabaret freaking night, nightclub. In a milkshake venture, we also did. And we, we began getting involved in the entertainment business. And the cabaret business was fun. It was, it was different. <laughs> Imagine, you know, drag artists and cabaret artists and all this type of thing. A little different, uh, you know, dealing with import-export. <laughs> but the figures were solid and it was an established business. And although high revenue, the margins were, f the margins were slim, you know. They were, they were a little dicey, the margins. Which amazed me, actually, because I always assumed, I think a lot of people do, that you see bars, okay, you go in a nightclub and you... You see, uh, you know, you see all the money gone in the tills and, the, and the, you see the, you know, the bartenders taking all these 10 and 20 notes. But the margins actually, when you, when you chop everything off, aren't actually as good as what you'd think. They can still be, you know, a little attractive, but they're not anything what you'd imagine them to be if you're not in the business. So anyway, um, I chopped at expenses like a tree man chopping a trunk. Lots of small expenses were chopped. And without compromising the revenue and the quality, that's really the key for me of a business strategy. When you're buying a business, if you're you know, buying a small business, if you're buying a big business, whatever it is, look at how you can keep revenue stable while chopping away at the unnecessary expenses. And there's a lot of, most businesses, you know, when it's been the same owner for a period of time or the guy who started it, they've accumulated a lot of these little expenses. And they get forgetting about because people say it's only 20 quid, it's only 40 bucks, it's only 100 bucks, it's only 20 a month, it's 30 a month, 10 a month, whatever it is. But you add all these up and it accumulates into thousands, which I'm going to show you how we did it here. And just to give you an example as well, um, I mean, many people look to add revenue and they end up investing in expenses. Most people, they buy a business and they say, okay, we want to increase Revenue. What can we do? Make more money. We're turning twenty thousand a month, uh, twenty thousand a week over. How can we get it twenty-two? Which is good. You want to push the boundaries. You want to push revenue. You want to push innovation. That that's good. Okay, I'm not going to condemn that. But what I mean is, instead of investing up front in trying to increase the revenue, we kept things stable, but we did it differently. We cut at expenses. We made slight price increases based on the local competition and what we offered in comparison. We added like, you know, not a lot, but I'm, I mean like adding like three, four percent here and there, which were unnoticeable to customers. We negotiated with new drink suppliers and we brought in cash for promoting, we promoted Smirnoff, you know, the vodka brand, and they gave us some cash up front for entertainment for promotions if we, semi, if we promoted their brand along with, the, um, along with the show. So we used that for marketing expenses and I got, trust me, I got that money to work a long way. Again, this was all using leverage. So anyway, after the roller coaster rides with the businesses, I decided I wanted to create the virtual boss lifestyle, which brings us to this podcast and this show and this crazy life that I'm living right now, or crazy fun life, should I say. And that meant I could be non-location dependent. So back in, this is maybe 2014, I, 2014, yeah, I had virtual assistants and I even had a call center in the Philippines for a while. But I hated paying third-party management fees. You hear me saying this on all the shows. I hate it. This is why I went to Guangzhou a few years, you know, six, seven years ago. I wanted to cut the middleman out. I wanted to go direct. I didn't want to be paying, you know, all these fees for someone to bring it over to me. Just like recruitment companies when they charge you these big freaking bloody $500, $1,000 fees. I do not like it. I want to, I want to cut all these guys out. So anyway, I hated you using the recruitment services as they promised me the earth. They charged the big fees and then they usually disappointed based on my experience. So I wanted to do it myself. You know, I'm not daft. I've got common sense. I can hire someone in the UK. It's not different in the Philippines. Yeah, there's a slight, you know, a few differences in culture, but there's also differences in culture if you hire someone in the UK. Let's say they come from, a, you know, a Muslim background or a Christian background or a Catholic background, you know, whatever it is. Or they might be Chinese, they moved across to the UK. Well, suddenly is it some kind of like huge dilemma to interview them? I mean, come on, <laughs> we're living in a global world. We're living, you know, we've got the internet. When I say about cultural differences, I mean, just maybe, you know, keep the, you know, keep the crude jokes to yourself during the interview process. And you know what I mean? Let's not go over the top here. So anyway, I wanted to do it myself. 
I couldn't find a way, so I became obsessed, just like I was when I was 17, obsessed with cutting the cost. So I created virtualstaff.ph, which helps other entrepreneurs hire Filipino virtual assistants and remote staff in the Philippines, but with the zero recruitment fee. No recruitment fee. It's, it's a, a site that connects both parties without the need to use an external recruiter who promises to find you the candidates. You don't need it. So we created that, and it was great. I mean, virtualstaff.ph, it's simply a platform that lets entrepreneurs directly connect, and they hire remote workers in the Philippines. See, you can see a resume, you can post jobs, and bingo, boom, interview, hire, just like you would back home, without the middlemen sticking their fat fingers in your wallet and taking a cut of your hard-earned cash, or readies, or gelt, as we say in the UK. What would Del Boy, what would Arthur Daly say? Nice little learner, or nice, nice little learner, Terry. <laughs> if you're a Minder fan, if you're in the UK, what a great show that was. My dad was a big show, a fan of the show, and it got me into it when, when I was a kid, although the show had finished. But, yeah, definitely worth a watch. <laughs> Anyone who's maybe younger or my age, 24, you'd probably find the graphics a little crap, but great show. Okay, so that's me. That's Michael Brody. That's the virtual boss. That's, and really, that's my backstory of what business experience I have. I didn't have a business degree, didn't have a fancy degree. Instead, I learned it on the streets, and I did it the hard way. My granddad was in business. You know, granddad was in business, and he, he insisted that I learned it this way, which was from nothing but a goal, persistence, and more persistence. You know, no big handouts. Give me a grand to, give me a grand to help me with the initial capital back when I was 14 when I um, was selling things in the school, lent me a thousand, give me a thousand quid, which is about, at the time, about $1,400. That's what I started with. That, and I hustled myself, and I built it into 3,000, 5, 10, 20, 50, 100, you know, so on. And this, you know, as a teenager, it's a lot of money to have. Trust me, it's a lot of money, to, but it, it wasn't difficult. It was just a lot of common sense and persistence and doing the right things. Anyways, I also... I also read the business books, many autobiographies. I read you know, Duncan Bannatyne. I read the Paul Ramond, the, the Soho guy. I read Sam Walton's. I read um, Peter Jones, the Apathetus. I read all these autobiographies, and they were really good. They helped really just cement me what I wanted to do. And also, one thing I will say about reading. Reading's great and reading's bad. You're like, what the hell are you saying? No, no. Reading's very good. Everybody should read, but... You've really got to be careful what you read because a lot of personal development books, they are regurgitated and a lot of the people who do them aren't necessarily qualified to be able to do them. So what you get is you get regurgitated information, but that information itself mightn't be the best information to have. So you end up basically brainwashing yourself to believe something's right and it mightn't be right. So just be careful with that and make sure that you're reading good stuff, people have been there and done it. I had a natural tendency of curiosity as well. You probably do. You're, on, you're listening to this show today. You're young, you're ambitious, you're hungry. You've obviously got a tendency of curiosity as well. And find out people's story. Do it. You know, Learn and really ask questions and absorb other people's experience and information. Make sure it's the right information and experience. Filter it yourself. Take in the good stuff. Get rid of the bad stuff. You should be curious. You need to have a goal. You need to act as if you already know you're going to attain that goal as well. Act as if. I did with the shop when I was 17. I mean, you know, there was no... I was nervous as hell. I'm meeting these 40, 50-year-old executives in suits. I'm 17-year-old. Left school nine months earlier. You know, <laughs> bad skin and <laughs> skinny back then as well and all that. But I acted as if, I acted with confidence, I knew what I wanted, and I was there to get it. I even, by the way, I even negotiated this lease, I paid 25% of the asking rent. <laughs> Can you imagine, 25% I had flexible lease, no liabilities. Awesome as that. And let me give you some advice here from what I learned. This is just straight from the heart, because 95% of people don't know why they work. Many people reply, to pay the bills. Here's a phrase that I read as a kid, and it's, it's stuck in my mind from when I was 13, 14, and it's still a very important phrase for me. 
observe the masses and do the opposite and you'll most likely be joining the road to success. So have a goal, know what you want and go after it like your life depends on it because it does. Your life depends on it. And here's another important thing to remember. If you want to take the island, burn the boats and you'll take the island. Because people, if they're going to die or succeed, tend to succeed. So burn the f***ing boats and you will take the island. Know what you want and then go after it. If you want to be a virtual boss, if you want to... Someone said to me, okay, someone said to me when I had the shop, Michael, you can't have the shop, you're too young. I opened the shop. They said, you can't have more than one, you know, people will steal. I opened more than one. They said, you, you don't know anything about the nightclub business. The nightclub business went well. You know what I mean? The point I'm trying to make here is, and then, by the way, when I said, after all this, I've already had the success and with the businesses, and then somebody said, you know, Mike, you, you can't hire people overseas. You know, you've got to hire them here. And now things are going better than ever. <laughs> the virtual boss lifestyle. I'm, I'm sitting here in... Barakai at the moment, Google it, a beautiful place. I'm sitting on a balcony doing this show with you today. I didn't even think this was imaginable. You know, even three, four years ago, I didn't think this was possible. But it is, and it wasn't actually very difficult to do. All I needed to do was get the right mindset and, and know, you know, hire VAs in the Philippines, which, which you have three or four, five hundred dollars a month. And now I've got that ability. I've got the experts working for me. I've got a great team. Like, really great team. I'm not just saying this. Like, a great team. These are great guys. Absolutely fantastic guys who are working for me. So use leverage. Multiply yourself. Hire virtual assistants here in the Philippines. Even if you don't use virtualstaff.ph as the platform to use, to do it. Do it anyway. If you want to use a recruiter or a staff finder, use them. I'm not, you know, whatever. But just... Really, seriously consider doing this. It, it changed my whole life and the way I did business. I'm 24 years old now. This is like, this is a, a podcast recorded in, um, you know, in May 20, I'm losing track of day. This is a podcast, May the 1st, 2017. Um, and trust me, this changed my whole life. Really did. But in time, I can work when I want to work. You know, I'm rich not just in money, but in time, because I can now you know, sit here on a balcony and do it because that's what I wanted to do. And that's what you want to do. You know, you can do all these things. It's really not difficult. It's serious. You don't, you don't need to pay someone thousands to tell you to do this. I'm telling you this on this podcast for free because it's. Pa I'm passionate about it. I'm passionate about it. And I know back when I was a kid, I, I, you know, I did it. Seventy. I didn't pay five grand for a course to show me how to make money and open retail shops. But I can work when I want, but most importantly, I have talented people working for me that most entrepreneurs couldn't afford to have if they hired domestically. Especially if I'm talking to you here and you're a startup business, you're a small business, most of you couldn't hire a team of 10 or 15 employees. You couldn't even afford two, three, a lot of people. So tweet me at the virtual boss and I'll send you the free salary guide as well for hiring Filipino virtual assistants. It's a game changer. We can send you that for free. Just tweet me at the virtual boss, and then you can see what thing you know what 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 I'm paying for for virtual assistants and virtual staff, and you can see if maybe there's something you can do. I mean, just imagine you have a digital marketer, a content writer, a video editor, and a general virtual assistant to handle social media and emails, and let, and that was costing you less than two thousand bucks a month in salary costs. That's less than one employee in America. And it gives you almost a five to one advantage over your competition. So you're going to, it's called kick ass advantage. That's what I call it, fucking kick ass advantage. So why do you want to be in business? What inspires you and what are you good at? I don't know, but you do. So ask, ask those questions and ignore the naysayers and focus on your vision. Because often people told me I could not do things they said, Michael, you're too young. You are too young. Even now, I've done all this. and This is before people know what I've done. And they're like, dude, you're so young, you're so young to be in business. I'm like, guys, I've been eight years. I've been eight years since I've been in you know, commercial property. But I've actually been in business for, you know, I would, I would say 13 years since I, since I was like 11. You need revenue, okay? So... That's what you really need to do. 
So you need revenue, of course. One of the major failures in business is lack of customers and lack of revenue. However, my advice to you here as an entrepreneur is always keep an eye on the bottom line. Remember, turnover is vanity and profit is sanity. A Jewish guy said to me once, um, a Jewish guy, a Jewish accountant, and he said that saying, and it's stuck in my mind forever. Turnover is vanity and profit is sanity. It doesn't matter if you could turn over $100 million, but if you're making no money, who gives a fuck? I'd rather turn over a million dollars and be making 500 or 600,000K. You know what I mean? So remember, just remember what I did in the nightclub. I stabilized revenue, but added around you know 8% on the profit margins by slight price increases of 3 4%. And I cut silly costs like overpaying on window cleaners, renegotiating entertainment costs. I even renegoti- renegotiated the doorman, you know, the bouncers on the front. I brought in a new firm. They were two quid an hour cheaper, two pound an hour cheaper. That's about $3 an hour at the time. So times it by two, we had to have two guys on. It was compulsory six hours, seven days a week for the licensing. So we needed two in case of trouble inside. So we actually saved around 9,000 pounds. That's like 12 or $13,000 a year by doing that. That was nine grand added to our profit. Not bad for a simple renegotiation, renegotiation what took me like, you know, 10 minutes. The point I'm making is if you already have a business now, or if you're looking to buy one or you're thinking of buying one, look for ways where you can add profitability without compromising the revenue or turnover, as we say in Britain. That's, you know, my grandma was says turnover. How much did you turn over? But I say revenue because I have been Americanized, <laughs> semi-Americanized. I'm still proud to be British. Anyway, common sense is not so common. My granddad taught me this as a kid, and it's so true. Common sense is not so common, but it's essential. You need it in business or someone, this is what will happen, okay? Someone will pull your pants down, bear your ass, they'll take your pants off, and some schmuck will end up buying them back in a markup. <laughs> now, that's the sale of a century. That is what you call a good salesman. <laughs> but seriously, have common sense and know that not everyone has your best interests at heart. Remember, there's so many people out there who are trying to sell you something. Everybody's a salesman, by the way. So be careful that you're not sold the wrong thing and that you're not, you know, suckered in or scammed. Really be careful because especially when you start to grow and, you know, more opportunities open, but also your confidence grows and confidence is a great thing, but don't be overconfident where you become arrogant to the in, in, in the respect of you're untouchable or, you know, the greatest thing since sliced bread because that's when you can really, 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 you know, get humbled. That's when you can really get uh, advantage taken of you. Heck, you look at YouTube or Facebook sponsored ads. How many people have them ads pop up? You know, the videos, the Ferraris and all that kind of thing. And this is what these guys do. Most of you know this, but I'll just quickly cover it anyway in case you don't, because it could save you thousands. How many people try to lure you in with bait, like a fish in the water? They hook you with enticing videos showing them in a Ferrari, a Porsche, a Bentley, a Roller the big house, they tell you they make millions doing very little. Most of them work, you know, most of these guys actually only work an hour a day apparently, but they, you know, I don't know. (laughs) Run a mile. Please, please, please don't fall for it. These people are clever. They're not, these aren't daft guys, by the way. A lot of these people are very smart and a lot of them are actually do accumulate wealth, but they're clever at getting you to spend money on their formula for getting rich. And here's the thing, they prey on you wanting to become successful and they tell you if you don't buy the course, maybe you're a failure and you start to compare yourself and you go, I'm not a failure, I want to buy the course, I want success. And that's a good thing that you're hungry for success. But they, they, as I said before, they prey on you wanting to become successful and then they sell you some cheap gimmick for thousands, something that should should be free really or cost you like $10, $20 you know, it's like an article from a, a section from a book and they charge you like three, four, five thousand bucks for it. Instead, guys, keep your money. Use that money to actually get started in business. Gurus make their money from their followers. They then eventually get the Ferrari themselves. However, they got it by selling the gullible people a get rich quick product, not what you thought. You thought they were already successful. You thought they had all this success. But in fact, the success came from you, from your wallet. Now, don't get me wrong. There's some super successful people out there. 
and there's some real great digital products. I myself, I've bought, um, I remember I bought a Grand Cardone product, uh, Close a Survival Guide. It was, it was a great book and audio, great product, and I felt I got good value from it. I got tremendous value from it in my personal experience. So that's just an example of a product that worked for me. However, I've also seen a lot of people, I've got a lot of friends, you know, and a lot of, from around the world, especially in my, you know, my line of game, the virtual boss, I'm all over the place, I like America, Mexico, and Philippines, UK, whatever it is, and I've seen so many people simply copy the old book, you know, like Think and Grow Rich, great book, by the way, and they sell people the information, repackaged for upwards of $5,000, the power of persistence, or the mastermind principle, Join our mastermind group. Dude, 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 dude. Sam Walton had no mastermind group, became the richest man in the world. Ray Kroc didn't have a mastermind group. You know, these a lot of people didn't. I can't remember Zuckerberg talking about his mastermind group either. The point I'm trying to make here is, you know, don't fall victim for it. Please don't. And But, you know... Go after what you want in life. Be inspired. You can do it. I don't care if you're 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 22, 25, or even 30, or even 40. And when I say about age, by the way, guys, it could even be 60, 65, 70. Maybe you're freaking 75. I don't know. Here in the Philippines, the president, um, he's got no congressional experience. He was a mayor of a city. He's the president of the Philippines. He's like 72, 73. Whether you you know like him or dislike him on political views, the point I'm trying to make here is um, age is not a prerequisite for success. So be inspired, go after what you want, and remember, I do appreciate you listening to me again today. And if it has helped you, and if you would like to chat to me, if you'd like to roll speak, hang with me, dude, online. Cause we're, we're, we're online warriors now, man. We can hang. Okay, so you can follow me on Twitter, Michael Brody, and my Twitter is, guess, Michael Brody, his Twitter is, at the virtual boss, and remember, leave us a ratings and a comment for the show today, a good one, <laughs> leave us a damn, you better better be a freaking good one, if it's a bad one, don't leave it, <laughs> I'm only joking. But thanks for listening. Look forward to chatting to you on Twitter, hearing your stories. I want to hear your stories. I want to hear what inspires you. I want to hear what you want to do with your life, what you want to do in business, anything that, you know, if you, Mike, you, maybe I can get involved somehow. I can help you in some respect. If you were inspired like I was when I was 17, I want to help as much as I can with advice or maybe I can give you a contact or two who, you can, who can help you further. But thanks for listening. I'll see you on Twitter at The Virtual Boss, and we hope to see you again on a slightly different episode of Confessions of a Virtual Boss. Thanks again, and have a great day.